Well, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we always feel a little bit nervous when we go to uh, speak in front, in front of such an auspicious audience. But after the introduction about Manita, and now I have to be interviewed afterwards, I'm doubly nervous about coming in front of you this morning. But it is great to be in Sri Lanka again. And thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to talk to you about not just about building a destination, but also about the World Travel and Tourism Council, what we do and how we feel about tourism. And I guess apologies, you've had to listen to me last night. That was a bit of a surprise. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so uh, some of what you heard last evening, I'm afraid you will have to hear again today. But I'm sure that we all look forward to hearing other insightful comments from the leaders in this room of the Asian hospitality and tourism sector about the strength of our industry, how hoteliers can maximize their returns, and how owners can manage their assets most effectively. We live in a complex world where economies, business development, sustainability, and security are all interlinked. This is the big test to see if my slides are working. Almost. And travel and tourism really does reflect that uh, complexity. At the WTTC, our role is to combine all parts of our great and wide-reaching sector and to share information about the number of jobs which we create and our contribution to global GDP and our beneficial effects on society. So our members are the chairman, presidents and chief executives of the world's largest travel and tourism businesses, from airports to airlines, car hire to cruise lines, hotels to tour operators, travel agency to technology suppliers. WTTC members represents every major travel and tourism sector across the world. We focus on the economic and social importance of travel and tourism, the economic wealth we generate, the jobs we create, and our contribution to creating peaceful societies. So I think within our industry, we really have a good story to tell. Research shows that despite the upheavals in the global economy over the past several years, our sector remains resilient. Globally, in 2016, travel and tourism will contribute nearly 10% of the world's GDP and some $7.2 trillion. $800 billion of investment in the form of airports, seaports, roads, resorts, high-speed rail and other infrastructure and 6% of global exports, and 30% of all global service exports. Around the world, we support somewhere in the region of between 280 and 284 million jobs, which equates to one in 11 jobs on the planet. This year, we expect travel and tourism to grow by about 3.5%, more than double the GDP growth of other parts of the world and other sectors. In the long term, we forecast that this trend will continue and our sector will grow by 4% each year for the next decade. And by 2026, one in 10 of the world's jobs will be supported by travel and tourism. The sheer scale and economic potential of travel and tourism is not always appreciated by governments, the Sri Lankan government being a big exception, and many of whom will look at individual sectors such as aviation, hotels, car hire, and cruise lines in isolation. So at the WTTC, we explain these numbers to governments so they can develop policies which encourage the long-term sustainable development of travel and tourism. Here in Sri Lanka, travel and tourism contributes over 11% of GDP and supports 820,000 jobs, or 10% already, of total employment. Euromonitor reports 17% growth of inbound arrivals, reaching somewhere in the region, again, we say of 1.8 million and 2 million travelers, and even higher growth rates from Europe, North America, and China. And I'm sure Manita will be talking about the potential of China, particularly as we see over 100 million outbound visitors already on an annual basis from China. The WTTC, in cooperation with the UNWTO, has a program entitled The Open Letter, whereby we ask global leaders to endorse our statement proclaiming the benefit of travel and tourism to their economies. I'm pleased to report that Sri Lanka has already formally endorsed this pr proclamation by His Excellency the President. 
When we survey the wider political and economic landscape, we see three mega trends which will continue to dominate the sector globally and regionally for many years to come. We see the need to work with governments to ensure that their policies create business environments which are conducive to the growth of travel and tourism. This means creating tax regimes which will allow the private sector to be competitive. Tourism is taxed more highly than many other industries in different parts of the world, and WTTC research proves the damaging effect this can have on the growth of tourism. It means planning and building infrastructure that will be capable of absorbing this incredible growth over the next 25 to 30 years. And we see the challenges that they have in the United Kingdom in trying to get a third runway in Heathrow, and indeed in our efforts to try to get the, uh, air, the airport passenger tax abolished, which has not been abolished. It means recruiting and training the right people with the right skills and being available to meet the future demand. And this is particularly important for the hospitality industry. The 280 million jobs, sorry, that's gone a bit, is it all right? The 280 million jobs we support are spread throughout every city, town, and country in the world. Very often, travel and tourism provides the only job in a household. Over the course of the next 10 years worldwide, the businesses which make up travel and tourism industry will need another 80 million people to work, which I think is pretty good news actually for all of us, that we will be employing more people in our industry. Yet, when I speak to the leaders of the world's travel and tourism companies, it is clear that the biggest challenge to their growth plans is the supply and retention of talent across all levels of their businesses. Research by the WTTC shows that failure to recruit and train the right people could cost the sector hundreds of billions of dollars. We are a people industry which depends on quality people to deliver a quality product to our customers. We need the right policies, programs and partnerships in place to ensure that the workforce of the future knows about the opportunities in our sector and has the appropriate skills and knowledge to support future growth. It is even more important in developing destinations like Sri Lanka, and it is our responsibility to ensure that as we open new hotels, develop the country's infrastructure, we also integrate with local communities, and we educate, employ, and develop local talent. I'm pleased to learn that in a recent statement, the Minister of Finance for Sri Lanka acknowledged that this country will require almost 100,000 trained workers to sustain its rapid growth in tourism. Quite a challenge. This will be achieved through vocational and third level education to ensure that local communities have the right skills to be able to get these entry level jobs. As Chancellor of the Embers Academy of Hospitality Management in Dubai, I'm pleased to report that earlier this year, the Academy has signed a partnership agreement with the local Sri Lankan company, Omega Global, to provide guidance for hospitality and service training. Through this partnership, we aim to instill world-class hospitality excellence in various areas, such as airport custom services, finance, hotels, and tour providers. I'm also pleased to see the government in Sri Lanka is adopting a plan to make the country a high-value destination. It will showcase its cultural heritage, wildlife, and the environment through provinces developed as unique tourism locations. Here in Sri Lanka, I'm also pleased to see the adoption of a modern electronic travel appro approval platform, which streamlines visit visas and at the same time enhances security. Though I would say, charging $35 every time you go online to get the visa, which has to be renewed quite frequently, does seem a bit high. And it also, I ask the question, what would happen if I'm traveling with a family of three children and a wife, for example, where everybody has individual passports? Do we have to pay 35 per person? It's a question, not a statement. It might seem lucrative in the short term, and we saw that in the United Kingdom, when the airline passenger tax was implemented, they said it was short term, but in, but in reality, it's long term. Governments get used to receiving the money. In Ireland, my country of origin, four years ago, VAT on tourism services was reduced from 23% to 9%. 
and we've since seen an annual increase of 16% in tourism arrivals. And as I said last night, we're now coming close in Ireland to 10 million visitors a year. That is with a population of 4.6 million, which I think is quite an achievement. Our sector, as we said, is growing by about 4% per annum, which means by 2035, the number of international travellers will have doubled to 2 billion people. Already it has reached 1.2 billion international travellers a year. And everyone in this room and beyond has a huge responsibility for safeguarding the environment and ensuring that the growth of our sector is managed responsibly and sustainably. Stepping up to our obligations on the climate change agenda will be a key focus for this industry. And the recent adoption of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is SDGs, which I'll talk about in a second, and the Paris Agreement to Combat Climate Change, signed last December, places a legal burden on every nation state to develop plans to reduce carbon emissions. The UNWTO has also declared with the United Nations endorsement 2017 as a year of sustainable tourism for development, a very important statement. In fact, we will be examining the way in which the SDGs, as they're called, are shaping our world and how our sector can be used to achieve them when we meet at the 2017 WTTC Global Summit in Bangkok next April. People travel for a myriad of reasons, business, conferences, visiting friends and relatives, to get some sun, and sometimes, like in Dubai in the summer, to escape some sun. But witnessing beauty and individuality is what really stirs the soul. From Machu Picchu to the canals of Venice, from Petra in Jordan to the wilderness of Antarctica, and of course, the beautiful sites of Sri Lanka, such as the sacred city of Kandy and the old town of Gale, which have now been declared, or have been declared for some time as UNESCO sites. Indeed, these are the places which almost every traveler wants to see. And that means that we have to take steps to preserve the cultural heritage of these sites for future generations. The WTTC is very active in this area through its Tourism for Tomorrow program, which recognizes our responsibility for sustainability within our great industry. And the long-term sustainable growth of that sector is under threat from one more final challenge and a much more immediate threat. For many years, we have all campaigned for improved visa processes to allow tourists to cross international borders as efficiently as possible, while still respecting the rights of sovereign states to manage security and immigration concerns. The last 18 months have seen an unprecedented number of attacks, mainly aimed deliberately at tourists, which brings the understandable call to make our borders even stronger. Given our vast economic and social importance, the question the industry is challenged with is, how can we keep our borders safe while keeping those same borders open to travelers and to tourists? The global random nature of the threat means this is a worldwide issue requiring a global solution which brings all concerned parties together. WTTC leads the Global Travel Association Coalition and together we are working to a plan which encourages the facilitation of travel through better use of technology to assist security forces, closer collaboration between the sector, policymakers, and security services, and electronic visas throughout, and of course better integration of travel and tourism into security planning procedures. What is clear to us is that our sector must be part of the solution for governments and it will take all stakeholders to work together to find the right solution which again balances safeguarding security with the economic and social contribution of travel and tourism. And again we see the benefit of Sri Lanka's e-visa program in this area. I also firmly believe that peace drives tourism. And I mentioned this again last night. We saw the positive examples in my native Ireland when the Good Friday Agreement was signed in April 1998. We saw the positive effects here in Sri Lanka, with tourism arrival numbers already growing since 2009 from 500,000 to 2 million. This re resulted in new jobs being created and an improved standard of living. So many people say that peace drives tourism, but I also believe that tourism drives peace. It puts a smile on people's faces, it alleviates poverty, 
It provides employment across all levels of society and, some of the, and in some of the most rem remote places on earth. It also fosters respect and understanding. True, tourism and travel benefits all of us and is very, very much a force for good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.